Alrighty, alrighty. So here we are. Happy Monday. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Let's not allow this horrible looking weather out there to make us depressed. <laughs> hey, look at my hair when he said that. What? I looked at your hair. How did this become a, a girl problem? <laughs> In fact, I was looking at Javier. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so we're going to begin, which is funny, you just proposed a problem. I'm going to talk about something interesting today that will go with that. Um, all right, so if you guys remember, we started a series called the Value Based Team Member. Uh, the big, big goal and the big idea behind this especially is because we want to develop ourselves so that we can go to this next level, especially with the new fund. And as we collaborate as a team, our goal is to not get lost as we're working together, but really develop a team that we're all growing, we're all developing, and we're all becoming better and better every single time. Um, with that said, as I'm admitting people here today, um, if you guys remember as a recap, we talked a little bit about uh, number one, understanding some of the prerequisites that sometimes hinder us from becoming a better version of ourselves. And then we started going into the very one out of eight important piece of how you add value to the company. If you guys remember, that was to bring money to the table, right? The more money we generate as a company, the more stability, the more value you bring. And generally, if somebody's bringing money to the company, they get a piece of that money. Okay, so it's imperative that if you want to bring value to the table, uh, you help the organization to become more stable by generating money. We also talked about how to do that, depending on which department you're in. And if you want more information, we'll be happy to continue to dive into that and help you guys to grow. Um, now we're in part two of the series. <clears throat> and uh, in part two, we're going to talk about something that I think is critical, that I think in our organizations are essential, in fact, for each and every one of us to think this way. And so today, what I would like to do as we're going through this is, is to get started to talk about this topic. But before, I want to give you a little story that I think goes really well with this. There's a father, and I know we have some parents here in the room and obviously online, and you guys know what it is like, especially if you've worked through COVID, to work at home with your kids. And I see some people smiling or some people crying because it depends on the circumstance or right, the experience. Um, this gentleman had an issue like that. He was working from home, and he had his beautiful daughter, and he realized very quickly that working from home was not that easy because his daughter kept coming into the room and kept saying, daddy, let's spend time together. And so of course the father was trying to figure out a way, how do I become a good dad? While at the same time, how do I get the job done? Uh, he ultimately started thinking, what can I do to not frustrate my daughter, but I've got to keep her. I have to distract her somehow to give myself a break. So he opened up a magazine and he found this beautiful map inside of the magazine of the world. And he figured I got a great idea. So he ripped it out, he cut it into pieces, he gave her a little roll of tape and he said, honey, why don't you go in the other room and I want you to put this whole puzzle together and bring back the actual world put together. And as he gave it to her and put the pieces out there with a little tape, he sighs a relief and he goes, oh, this is going to take her a while. And so sure enough, as he starts working in less than five minutes, the daughter comes back and she's like, daddy, look. And lo and behold, this young girl had accomplished this goal that he thought was extremely difficult. And he's sitting there just baffled about like, I mean, this would take me hours. How is it that my daughter figured this thing out in five minutes? And so he says, honey, I'm really impressed at how you put this thing together. I, I didn't think you'd do it so quickly. Could you tell me, how did you figure it out? And she goes, oh, daddy, in the back of the picture, there's a lady's face. So I just focus on putting the face together. And when I flipped it over, sure, lo and behold, <laughs> there's your map. And so the point I want to make is that when we're finding solutions to problems, a lot of times it's not looking at the problem, it's looking at it from a different perspective. And that's what helps us create the solution. And so I think we all guessed what we're going to talk about today, and that is problem solving. Um, and in organizations, I want to really make an important point. Nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. And if you want to bring value to an organization, you have to be a problem solver. That is one of the most important pieces to an organization. You know, I remember many, many, many moons ago when I actually worked with a massive organization called Capital One. I was a little peon there. And I remember when I first went through training and it was over six weeks of training. It was overwhelming from the softwares, policies and procedures, tools and resources. Literally, they had a call center if you didn't know what you were doing that you could call them and somebody would be there that was employed just to answer your questions. Just think about how incredible those processes seem. And to me, I was just so blown away and so impressed by how big this organization was and these incredible tools. And what I didn't realize until I actually officially got on the floor and started working there 
is that the reason why they had to put all these things together is because even if you plan everything perfectly, there is always a problem that needs to be solved. And the organization, no matter how big, no matter how perfect things look, always has problems because nothing ever goes as planned. You guys agree? And so the point that I'm making here, whether you're in a small organization or you work for massive organizations that have thousands of employees that have billions of dollars of capital to invest in the resources, there is always a problem to be solved. And what I also found is that the people that were making the most money over time were the people who were in charge of solving problems. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. If you were just a peon and you sat there and you just literally worked on one little piece, you got paid accordingly. But if you actually got to the point where you created solutions for the organizations, whether it was leadership issues, whether it was technology issues, or whatever those problems were, if you were, if you actually solve problems, you can really find a good spot in that position that paid you more because the value was based on solving those problems that cost the company money and creating opportunity for the company to make more money. Does that make sense? And so in the same way, the two out of eight that we're going to be covering in the series is how to be a problem solver. Now, before we go into that, I want to first talk about this. This is what you don't do when a problem arises because a problem will arise as we know. The first thing you don't want to do is blame other people. That is the very first thing you don't want to do. And unfortunately in human nature, when something goes wrong and you're collaborating with somebody, if you know it wasn't you, what is our human reaction to this stuff usually? Well, it wasn't my fault, it's Honey's fault. It was her hair. <laughs> Just kidding, by the way, please don't hit me. Uh, but what, what is the point that I'm making, right? Because why? The first thing we want to do is explain to the world why it wasn't me, it was you. The problem with that is number one, it shows you a level of maturity. When you're blaming other people, what you're actually reflecting is just how low your level of intellect really is with interconnection and intercommunication skills. That's really what we're showing. And so the reality, what I wanna challenge you to do is stop thinking about it from the standpoint of blaming other people and know that every time you blame somebody else, what you're really revealing is your level of leadership skills. And so let's pause for one minute and say, if there's a problem, everybody would agree, we don't blame another person, all right? The next thing you don't wanna do is what a lot of people do, which is what? Complain, people that are always complaining. When you complain, you embrace the negative, basically ensuring that you don't find a solution. When you're blaming other people, you don't have anything left in your brain to be thinking about a solution because you've already decided that you're the victim. So I'm gonna blame and I'm gonna complain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so it does not create a solution. All it does is it creates a frustration for you as you complain about a situation. Now, please don't confuse venting for complaining. Sometimes we have to just go in a room and be like, oh my goodness, right? Because if not, you'll explode, that's okay. But when you're complaining and you're blaming somebody else, there is nothing positive that comes of it. So I just encourage you, if you're getting frustrated, take a walk, breathe. Thank you for the heads up. Mm -hmm. Take a walk and breathe and let it out, right? And then come back and then you start reframing the way you think about things. Another key thing that I want to bring up to everybody's attention, and this is something that's very popular, is make excuses. Generally, we make excuses when we are either partially or entirely at fault. We start making excuses. Well, I didn't have the right tools. Hey, you didn't give me clear direction on what I was supposed to do. My dog ate my homework, right? I didn't feel good. When we make excuses, we basically just created a reason for the issue and we're never going to find a solution when the whole time we're basically explaining why the issue happened instead of trying to find the solution for the problem. Does that make sense? So in essence, you become a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. So excuses also don't work. And lastly, a lot of people do this too. We ignore the problem. Now, I want to tell you a brief story. I, I can't really say too much because chances are this is going online, but I'll just say that I know a gentleman that many, many years ago um, was a part of our family and he made some decisions that ultimately resulted in some bad situation that took place. Now, given the circumstances of how bad the situation was, we wanted to help to create a solution. And in fact, we had somebody actually ready and lined up to buy this person's vehicle that they couldn't afford anymore. The person decided they didn't even want to take the time to go call the bank and find out what they owed, even though we literally had somebody that could take over the car and take over the payments, we just needed the balance. They got really frustrated and said, well, I don't have time right now, I'll have to do it later. So we actually lost the buyer for the car. 
So two weeks later, what do they do? They go and return the car, ruin their credit because they couldn't keep the payments with the, with the plan of what they were doing. What did they do? The problem still existed, but while there was a potential to create a solution, what did they do? They put their head in the sand and pretended like nothing was wrong until it was wrong. And how many times do we do that sometimes, especially when we get emotional about something, we ultimately ignore the issue as if we ignore it, it'll go away only to find out that it just builds up and it gets even worse. And so again, that's one of the things, again, you don't want to do. So to recap, if you want to be a problem solver in a company, you want to be able to earn your stripes and get more value out of a company, then you have to understand that blaming others won't help you. Complaining about it won't help you. Making excuses won't help you. And ultimately ignoring the issue won't help you. So now that we've addressed what you don't do, let's take a look at what we do. Now I want to give some, some, some credit to, there's actually some of the research that I was doing actually was interconnected with this company called Cisco. They have a networking academy. And uh, what I liked about it is their systematic approach to creating solutions to problems in networks. And I really believe that even after looking at that, that really helps with business. And then in doing some more research, I saw this really cool visual uh, that I think goes really well with it. And so I want you to take a look at solving problems is ideal. All right. And so when you really think, take a look at it, you talk about identify, define, explore, action, and look back. And that's what we're going to talk about is what are the questions, what are the steps that we need to take from an actual precision perspective to be able to identify some problems. Now, before I begin, I want you to consider this. Some of the problems we face are minor, they're small, right? They're really not that massive of an issue. Uh, so I think this can help, but sometimes what you'll find is that the issue is just a little symptom that when you dig in, there's a bigger problem. And if you solve that problem, then all the little spiders that keep coming disappear, right? And so that's, that's what I want to address right now. So let's begin with step one. We need to identify the problem. If you don't identify the problem, obviously you're never going to deal with the issue to begin with. And so when you're starting to get symptoms, you wanna be able to get there as quickly as possible and say, what do I feel is causing this? So <clears throat> the best starting point is to define what needs to be fixed. So if you think about the problem that you're having, one of the best things you could be doing is saying, what exactly am I dealing with here that needs to be fixed? What is broken? And if you start identifying that as a team, you'll be amazed at how quickly you can start looking for those solutions. I'll, I'll talk about another piece that's important to identify the problem. Review the situation and separate the symptoms from the cause. And again, that's part of the mindset that I want to challenge you guys to think. When there's a problem, there's usually the symptoms that we're dealing with, but there's an underlying cause you have to deal with. And that's what you want to start identifying. And so the faster that you can list those issues out to start trying to sift through to find out what the actual cause is, the faster you get to the solution to be able to resolve this overall. Another thing is if need be, bring a fresh mind to help you to analyze. You'll be amazed at how many times we get so stuck and so caught up on that little map, right? And all these little pieces, when somebody with a fresh mind says, well, why don't we flip this thing over? Oh, there's a face. You guys follow what I'm saying? And so a lot of times it's just a matter of being humble enough to say, look, I'm having these issues in this project and I just don't know what's happening. And just being able to collaborate with somebody might help you to identify those problems very quickly. And that's the reason why teams are so important. Now, once you've started to identify the problem, the next step is to determine the root cause and getting, now you wanna nail it down so they know exactly what's really causing it. So let's break it down. These are some key questions that they recommended. It says, what is behind it? Always trying to ask yourself, what is behind this issue? Is it a technology issue that we're dealing with? What is behind it? Is it that the problem is the customer has an issue of not understanding the process? What is behind it? The next one is, what is causing it? Are you finding a trend every time we come up with this issue that seems to be very similar? So again, the idea here is to be able to identify and determine the root cause. Another question you can ask is, <clears throat> can it be qualified or disqualified? Sorry, there's a typo there. Can it be qualified or disqualified? Quantified, sorry. And so the idea behind it is sometimes these issues cost money, right? And sometimes these issues cause, a, a, for example, if we have a network issue and we can't get online, I mean, that can cause a delay of time for all of us, right? So we want to get to the, to the root cause of the problem, right? We want to sit there and look at it. Um, That was horrible writing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so 
So basically, what is what is at the core level? The whole question is at the core level. Is there anything simplified within it? That is what we're finding at the core level that's creating the impact, and that's the most important piece. Now, once you have the root cause, then we go into explore and find multiple solutions. Now, one of the things that I want to bring up is a lot of times, and this is Rick's problem, so I, I want to confess this so everybody knows that nobody's perfect. We all got to grow. A lot of times in the rush of things, what I try to do is put a band-aid on the problem so we can move on. And sometimes the most important thing to do is to sit back and say, whoa, whoa, let's stop. Let's take a look. What's causing this? What's the problem? Okay, now that we know the root cause, okay, now let's sit there and explore multiple options. Is it a matter of, you know, option one? And by the way, usually option one is usually not the right solution. Why? Because we just try to patch it. So what I encourage you to do, and what I've been trying to do even in some of the meetings we've had with problems that we've been dealing with, is no, let's stop for a minute, let's meet, let's talk about what's going on, let's take a look at all the potential options that are coming in, and as a team, let's start to identify multiple options to see which one lines better with what we're doing, and which one is gonna have a longer, a longer solution for the problem. And I think that's something very important that we need to really consider. So always seek multiple options and notate them. Start identifying and write down what you think could be a potential solution. Whether it's, hey, I started looking potentially for some new technology. One of the problems we're having is it's convoluted. So maybe I found a new software that makes it easier. But I don't know if that's the right answer. Let's just put that as one of the, the ones, the options. Another thing might be as simple as saying, hey, our intake sheets are incorrect on the problem. So why don't we streamline it to make it to the point where each person knows where their information goes. You see what I'm saying? You start writing down multiple options for that. Uh, and, that, and I'll tell you in a minute, that's critical because you can notate those solutions uh, and ultimately have somebody weigh in. <clears throat> the other thing, again, that's important is when you're writing those solutions, think out of the box. You'll be amazed how many times, again, it's not, it's not what you've been looking at. It's outside of what you've been looking at. And so you have to take a step back and look for additional solutions that may be a result. And I'll address that a little bit more in a minute. And then, of course, do research for what others have done. Um, one of the things that I'm finding more and more, like, for example, as we're launching this new fund, there's a lot of stuff I've never done on this fund level, because again, this is kind of a new thing. So I'm starting to find collaboration groups of different uh, organizations that have already gone through what I've done. And I'm starting to say, wait a minute, why should I reinvent the wheel when there's some guy here that clearly has been doing this? So let me ask them, what are they doing to deal with the accounting? What are they doing to deal with the capital raise? And does that make sense? And so a lot of times we get so caught up in ourselves that we don't think about the fact that somebody else has already been there, done that, got the t-shirt and found a solution. So sometimes it's as simple as, as you're documenting the solution, what are other people doing that are already successful at this? What are they doing differently? And starting to draw ideas from that. And then of course, collaborate with colleagues. Notice how now there's a trend. Like the more collaboration you do a lot of times, the faster you resolve the issue. And so again, it's important for us to really consider that uh, so that we can get it. So again, identify, determine the root cause, explore and find multiple solutions and document them. And now we're gonna go into the next piece, which is weigh the solutions that will work best. It's kind of doing the pros and cons, right? That we talked about. So now that you have a few solutions out there, well, some of the questions you may wanna ask that Cisco actually suggests you ask is, is it technically viable? Just because it sounds like a good idea for a solution, do I really think this is gonna solve that problem? Or is there something behind that that is gonna create yet another ripple effect that's negative, right? So there's always a cause and effect, so that's important. Is it scalable? How many times did we create a patch, but then we just realized that we became the bottleneck? When you become the bottleneck, can that really be the solution long term? No. Why? Because ultimately, it's gonna break you and it's gonna break the process, creating the problem once again. Does that make sense? So again, going back to is it scalable? Uh, one for, perfect example that I wanna kinda of hit here is, for instance, if we're doing more acquisitions and loans, and we think that the same process that worked before for one particular system is gonna work, and we just try to shove more down that pipe without trying to figure out how do we enlarge the process, how do we simplify things, how do we automate certain things so that it's the, the weight is flowing through instead of necessarily falling on people's shoulders. What do you think happens to someone like Monique or Tatiana? If they're the only solution to that. Well, before you know it, in the beginning, it's not a problem. But after a while, it becomes a much bigger problem because now they have to be working around the clock just to meet with the demand that's coming from everyone. Does that make sense? So it's imperative as a team to say, hey, is the solution that I'm putting together to streamline that, is it scalable? 
if we were to actually double, triple, quadruple the productivity on that, is that going to still be an issue? Does that make sense? And so that's the reason why it's so important when you're looking for a solution to really weigh those options and see what works best. Alrighty, another thing to consider is do you have the resources to implement it? Um, in a minute, I'm gonna give you an example that uh, a group out of Harvard did on, on, on some study and on, it's really interesting. But one of the things that a lot of people think, and, and this really shuts everything down, is they think either on one side of this pendulum or the other. They either think we don't have any resources, so we're operating out of poverty. So I don't even wanna bring up the problem or even try to come up with a solution because the solution is gonna be so expensive that they'll never fix it anyway. Ever think about that? We're just out of poverty mentality. We'll never have the money to fix this. And then you have the people on the other side of the pendulum that are like, oh, well, this is a billion dollar company. All you gotta do is put a million dollars and you'll, you'll fix the problem. And do you think both of those angles make sense? Absolutely not. So what you wanna do is you're looking for the solution is if there is a cost associated with the solution, whether it's technology, staffing, whether it's whatever, a consultant because we can't figure it out. At the end of the day, you start measuring what is the cost and what is the ultimate outcome that we think this can generate. And then you weigh those options and then you start measuring and say, hey, now do we have the resources to implement it? Do we have the right staff? Some people literally have technology. It doesn't cost that much, but until you have 25 people in there, it doesn't work. So you have to ask yourself, do we even have enough team members for this tool to work? Does that make sense? And so those are the things that we're looking for to find those solutions. And does the solution benefit the team? Um, a lot of times when we start thinking about fixing only our problems, we ultimately have a ripple effect on somebody else, right? And so what I have found is the solutions that last are solutions that implement and, and impact everyone else around them. And so just know that those solutions you're looking for should be a win-win. And the reason why is because even if you came up with a process that works, if it only works for you, in fact, I'll, I'll even tell you a funny story. A long time ago, we had somebody in the team that was really, really focused on developing processes. She built this incredible process. It was actually like really detailed, very well thought out. So I'm like, great, implement it. This is amazing. So she began to implement the process. And so the whole time I'm sitting here, man, this is really impressive. I, this process is great. Well, about four months into this process, I go back and I'm like, hey, so what's going on? Let's take a look at the results. I am just so frustrated. Nobody follows the process. I have no idea why this is even happening. In fact, I'm the one that's implementing the process by myself. And when I came back and I said, well, that's interesting. Well, who knows about the process change? Me? Well, if nobody knows about your process change, then how are they to know that they're supposed to help you with the, with the fix? And how does that benefit those people? Well, it really doesn't benefit anybody but me. So how could you expect somebody to step in? And do you guys follow? Mm -hmm. And so don't fall into that trap where you feel like you created this elaborate, smart solution when at the end of the day, it only benefits you. Ask yourself, is there something I can do that benefits everybody around me so that we get the whole team behind it? And then that's what you see take action and start taking form, right? So let's make sure we consider that. All right. And can it be measured or how will you measure it? Um, I think it is really important. This is where a lot of us make the mistake. When we try to come up with a solution on something is we put ourselves in a spot where it's only in our mind that we think we solve the problem, but there is no measurable picture. There's no way for us to say, this is the problem. Here's how we can basically quantify the solution fixing the problem. And so you may want to start asking yourself, hey, how can I measure this? Is it measurable to, to see the, the result, right? So once you have that, and, and I'll, I'm going to dive into this a little bit more, is now here's, here's the important part, is now we have to take action. Now that you've identified the problem, now that you've identified the root cause, now that you've looked for multiple solutions, and you started weighing in the key components of what it's going to take for this to be solved and how you can get the team involved and how it will benefit the company overall, then it's time to put a game plan together. So the first thing is think through the entire flow of the execution. Honestly, this is where I fall short sometimes. I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes I'm like, this, I got a great idea. This will solve the problem. And I only think of step one, two, three. And I forgot that there's 15 steps. Does it flow all the way through? And the answer is no. You guys follow me? So then immediately I'm like, execute, Monique, execute, so-and-so, Ani, execute. And everyone's executing. And then bam, we hit the wall at five. And we're like, oh, what do we do now? And we're like, oh. Here we go again, right? So one of the things we want to do, including myself, because I'm a bottom line kind of guy, I want to just do it, let's get it done, is at least map it out. And just say, okay, so one, two, three, four, we have 15 steps. 
does it help us flow or is there somewhere where it breaks? And again, if it's broken, go back to the drawing board and try to find a solution that will help throughout the whole process. For large solutions, think about who, what, and when, and how. And you just start asking yourself how that flow works. Again, we're just putting that together. All right, document the steps to the solution and keep notes to measure success. Now, I want to pause right here real quick and say that, you know who does this part really well? Darla. Really, really good at creating those processes. And at first, I'm like, there's just so much detail because <laughs> I'm a bottom line guy. But then later on, when I go back to something, I can go back to where she's got the steps and be like, oh, step one, follow along. <laughs> right? It makes way more sense to do that in the beginning than later on to come back and have to reinvent it every time. And it's really just honestly way more productive. So what I'm saying here is document the steps to the solution and then you keep notes and you measure whether it's working or not. Uh, because guess what? As you start implementing, not everything works perfectly. So you have to tweak it. In fact, we just did that on a project this past week, right? Which is where a lot of this keeps hitting in my mind is getting to the place where there's a problem. And then instead of getting upset and saying, well, see, it doesn't work. Look, so-and-so didn't put their notes. No, I'm saying no. Okay, so that part's broken. How do we make it easier? Where do we put the notation so that the analyst can put the notes? Where do we need this? What color schemes do we want so we can quickly visualize it? And again, it's just taking notes, making adjustments so that it gets better and better and better for that process. And when you have it documented, it's a lot easier because everybody else can follow along. Does that make sense? And that's a really important thing. Now, for staff specifically, when we're talking about the team here, okay? Let's say you are a problem solver and you're producing results, right? How easy, as I talked about last, last week, is it to get to a place where nobody even notices that you're a person of value? Think about that. It just, it's expected of you. Darla just does it, right? And then you don't really truly appreciate Darla. You just look at the problem. Hey, she just solves the issues. So this next piece, I believe, has two components to it that really benefits us. And again, we're almost done here. I just wanna make sure we get this piece. This last piece is a piece that I am now committing to myself to make sure that I do going forward. And it's, it's, it's out of my norm, so I have to be intentional about it. So I wanna challenge you guys to be intentional. And the reason why measure the success of your solution is so important, it's, it's not because you wanna go back and be like, well, look at how great I am. But it's because, and this is what I wanna show, these are some questions that they recommend you do and they gave me an example for how important it is. How does it measure against your goal? You see, the goal for most of us is to solve the problem, right? So, but we never take a reflection back to say, did this solve the problem efficiently? Is it really solved? And you get to go back and again, notate whether it's hitting the goal or not. Can you see a measurable outcome based on the solution being done? And then do you need to recalibrate or is the problem officially solved? One of the things that I find, and I do this again and again and again, and that's partially because I don't go back to reflect on that problem that I solved, is that by not going back to it, I never really fix the problems long-term because at some point in the future, we stop using that process because people forgot about it. And then what happens six months later is we deal with the same issue and we go back through the same process. But this time, because I didn't have my notes on it, we start the problem all over again without going back to the solution we found in the first place. And do you know how much money that costs an organization to go through that cycle over and over again? Just because we didn't reflect and notate back what it is that worked last time. How measurable was it? Was it, was it a success? We just go right back and we start complaining again and again later. Hey, this is broken. It's the same thing. We should have just gone right back to our process and studied what happened. And a lot of times it's because we don't take the time to measure what we did and how we achieved it. Another thing that I'm going to flip it on you. A lot of people say, well, I want to earn value. I want to make more money, right? Well, guess what? How will your leadership know that you were a solution person? Over time, think about it. We get busy. We get caught up. I, I don't think about that or with your leader, right? So by having a look back with your actual leader, think about how fresh on their mind it is that, hey, Stephanie, you saw this problem. We went back and you're sitting down with your management or leadership saying, hey, this was the goal. This was the issue. This was the multiple solutions. We selected this. Here's my journal of what I notated for the solution. And I'm just coming back to reflect and see, hey, has this been a solution overall? You guys follow that? By creating and finishing that loop and looking back, what you're doing is not only making sure that your solution will last, but you're also 
at the same time, bringing to your management's attention that you are a problem solver, that you are somebody that can be trusted to solve problems. Does that make sense? Not create more problems that came from one problem. And so that is one of the biggest things that I really want us to, to really consider. Now, earlier on, I talked about an example of the two people, right? One that's saying, hey, well, we have no money. We can't operate out of any revenue. And then the other person that's like, hey, we have a billion dollars. Why don't you just do it? So this is an actual study that was done with Harvard that I, I found was really interesting. And, and we'll wrap it up with this. <clears throat> so they did a study on an office building owner. And basically, this office building owner, obviously, has an office, multiple stories. So what usually is in an office building that has multiple stories? Elevators. Elevators. Well, one of the problems that we're having is some of you guys were here long enough to be in our old office and we had the same problem. Our elevators were very slow, very slow. Same with this organization. It got to the point that the tenants started going to the management company and said, listen, if you guys don't start fixing this elevator or doing something with it, it feels like an eternity every time I get in the stupid elevator, we're gonna, we're gonna start looking elsewhere. We just, we have, we can't do this anymore, it's not productive. So of course, what does a property management company do? They take this information, they go back to the owner and they say to the owner, this is the problem, sir, there's only one solution. I want you to basically replace the elevator, upgrade. So if you look at it, this is a very linear solution. Elevator's too slow is the problem. What is the solution? Make the elevator faster. Install a new lift, upgrade the motor, and imp or improve it, right? That's the mindset. Well, the owner says, well, wait a minute. Based on the rents that we're charging and based on the marketplace that we're in, we can't financially just justify putting $300,000 into improving the elevator system just so that people can be in there. Before we make the decision to make a change, we understand there's a problem. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to go back and I want you to have a meeting with all the tenants and all the floors. And I want you to start asking them some key questions. And so what does a property management company do? They go back to the people and said, look, we're working on a solution. Can I ask you a few questions? And they started asking these specific questions to the actual individual tenants on each floor. Then when they gather all the information, they go back to the owner and say, well, we found that there's really a couple of issues here. This is not just that the elevator is too slow. Uh, so these are the, the listed issues that we found. First of all, most people are really frustrated because Usually when everybody comes in and when everybody's leaving is around the same time. So it's not necessarily that it's slow, it's just that it's always piled up with people, right? Second of all, the elevator is completely made out of wood. So I feel really cramped in and squeezed into this little space. And so it feels like an eternity going up and down this thing is driving me crazy. And so they start listing all these other problems and he says, well, what, what should we do? What do you think the solution is? And so what they actually did after doing research is they started looking at other organizations that had the same problem. And what they found is that all of them had something in common. And what that issue was, is that when you're dealing with an actual elevator space that is enclosed completely, you actually tend to notice more that the elevator is going slowly because the room feels tight. It feels like it's enclosed. So check out this solution. What they actually did is they reframed the problem. <clears throat> the weight is actually annoying is really what the biggest number one issue after reviewing it. So what did they do? They made the weight feel shorter. What did they do? They put in mirrors, they play music and install hand sanitizers. And what was interesting about it is, even though that was the first phase of the ultimate upgrade of the elevator, what they found is that within two years of using this, they didn't even have to upgrade the elevator machine. Why? Because by making mirrors, the room felt bigger and you see yourself and you entertain yourself more. So think about that for just a minute, putting a mirror, playing a little bit of music and ultimately installing hand sanitizers was the actual fix to a $300,000 issue. And when they went back and interviewed the same tenants, they were like, we noticed a big change. What did they change? They didn't change the elevator. What they changed was again, the reframing of the problem, which is, hey, the weight is annoying. Another thing they put out there is they actually put little signs that say, hey, during these times and these times are high capacity. If you want to speed up the process, take the stairs or come earlier or after this. And so when you really think about it, sometimes we have this linear look like, oh my God, the only solution is we have to buy a bigger office building for our staff. That's the only way to solve this. And in most cases, when you do the rest of the research, you find out that really there were other issues. Why don't we address those first and see if that's where we need to stop? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I want to challenge us, let's constantly 
consider how do we add value to the team, but let's talk about reframing those problems and finding out what really is the root cause. Uh, and so again, I wanna, I wanna challenge us to consider that. So I'll leave you with this. Great quote from a really hairy guy, <laughs> Albert Einstein. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them in the first place, right? And so again, guys, let's think out of the box. Let's think about the team and let's use the same process that they use in programming and technology to find the issue, find solutions, and ultimately implement and execute. And let's not forget to look back to make sure that it was really solved and that everybody benefits, okay? So with that said, guys, I'm wrapping it up. Any comments or questions, feel free to chime in. I, I, I have something. Um, yes, ma'am. When we do measure our success or, or we're getting, before we measure our success, when we plan and implement, I think one thing that we, at least for me, um, I have to really work at is what is the exit? What is the closure on something? Mm -hmm. So when we plan something like even um, deals coming through the pipeline, what is the exit when they're closed? Right. What do we do that we're, and so I think we have to think all the way through. So think exit when you are planning to thinking Absolutely. of closure. I agree 100%. And actually, we were just having an issue like that recently with because we're again we're taking our processes and we're slowly building them to zone. And so here we are telling a programmer, here's how to fix this, but he really needs to see the whole picture. Because otherwise he's gonna make it to that, but then how does it integrate with the rest of the steps? And you're absolutely right. So part of that last call was literally give me a tree and show me how it all interconnects so that I can actually build it and think about those things. Because otherwise we're about to build a, a nice step. But ultimately, that next step wasn't really going to do much for the uh, the main problem of the next step. So it is it is really important to do that. And I think I have a chat now. So we'll do this great presentation. We'll appreciate do humility. I think it is also really important to remember that when problems come up, we're all on the same team. So it it uh, it's mm -hmm. us against the problem, not against each other. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Also, look, we have a problems that um, usually means. We are growing, which is a good thing. No problems means no growth. So embrace it. That, that's a really, yeah, really good point. Really that's a really good point. In fact, I'm going to copy that and quote it. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, because you're right. I mean, think about that. What a, what a great perspective. Because look, fr frame it this way. Some people complain, how was your day? Ugh, I'm just so busy. I'm overwhelmed. What a crappy day. Instead of saying, oh my gosh, the fact that we're busy really means that we're being productive. means that I, I have a job. I don't have to worry about what other people are worrying about right now, which is what do I do? What do I apply for another job, another position to be in? So you're absolutely right. And I, I love the teamwork piece. You're right. It, it is us against the world, not us against each other. So thanks for sharing. That was a really good, good input. Yeah. And when it comes to problems, I mean, we have to keep thinking on problem, then reaction solution, right? I mean, we face a problem, then we react to it. We don't ignore it and we create a solution. But the solution, just like Darla said, it has to have on every situation, not only on problems, whenever, whenever we're creating something, whenever we're bringing something to the table, it has to have a defined timeline. What is the expectation of this thing that we're doing? Like ideally, what are we trying to accomplish and what is the ideal outcome of that possibility or that new process or even the, the problem? If we're discussing a problem, what is the ideal solution and outcome that we're looking to accomplish? So as long as we look at it that way, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of problems we face. We'll always try to break our heads and, and have different opinions, but we'll find a solution. So. <clears throat> Absolutely. Really, really good points, everyone. Anybody else? No, no I, I'm sorry. It's, while you guys are saying anything, I, I got to change his head. His hair is driving nuts. <laughs> it's a problem for me. <laughs> No, so awesome. Anybody else comments, questions, concerns? Hey guys, I got like two minutes, so I have to jump in and say thanks, number one, for uh, all the birthday wishes. Much appreciated. But number two, in all honesty, it's about communication. And, and that's where everything starts. The clarity and the communication and making sure that, you know, I'm witnessing the processing team speaking with the loan officers now, right? It's almost as if a pressure valve was released by opening up a channel to have dialogue and to communicate. Um, and everybody's trying to do it. It's, it's if I go back into time and 
think about like Monique and thinking, man, she wants to kill my deal. It's like, man, there's nobody here that wants to get that deal done more than Monique, but we don't understand the problems or the issues that she goes through to get done or to get solved. So it does come down to, to communication. And if you don't understand something, you have to raise your hand and say something and step out um, rather than to sit and wait because then things get piled up and we get buried and then we can't find our way out. It's like quicksand. So all of this revolves around communication. And Rick, I appreciate uh, and Luis both uh, the vulnerability and, and you know it's like we're learning this together and everybody's got mm -hmm. parts that, that they're damn good at. Um, and as long as we continue to highlight that and, and to foster that, um, there, there's no limit to what we can accomplish. But it, again, it really comes down to communication. And I thank you guys both for opening up those channels. And, you know, everybody, what we're trying to do here is learn how to grow up and be a, be a big time company, uh, but to do it with faith and, and, and respect and character and integrity. Um, and that takes a hell of a lot of work. I think we got a great crew to do it. And especially the two leaders at the top guiding the ship. So thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you. And happy birthday, man. Appreciate it. How does it feel to be 49 again? You know what, man? <laughs> I'll tell you what, that trip in 49 has been hell, but I'll take it on. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, yeah, guys. Well, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you guys. We'll work through this together. We'll get to that next level. And, um, just super exciting. It's just obviously we just have to apply ourselves and let's have each other's backs, you know, and I, I think that was such a great, great, great comment there. I'm going to definitely put that in my notes. So thank you guys. So with that said, have an amazing week. And uh, for those in Florida, try to stay dry because it looks like it's going to be pouring all day. <laughs> uh, so awesome. All right, you guys, take care.